So what we're doing is we're doing uh, three presentations a month in four different cities. Uh, Brian Andreessen, who wasn't here, able to be here tonight, um, something about working, I don't know, with that job, something like that. So he's uh, up in San Francisco right now. He's going to be taking the, the San Francisco portion uh, of these, and we're probably going to bum rush. Don't tell him, Brian, close your ears real quick. Um, we're probably going to, some of us are going to bum rush him in one of these things and just show up and do the presentations and kind of freak him out. And uh, next week, we're going to be tuning in digitally. We're, so we're going to be sitting on the other end of a monitor and throwing some digital spit wads. I don't know if anybody's heard of twekle, which I think is a really weird word. Um, it's like heckling on Twitter. So uh, I call them digital spit wads. So we're going to be shooting him digital spit wads. So hopefully Troy is watching Twitter right now. And because I challenge people, hey, throw some digital spit wads. So that's what we're doing. We want to take over the world. So what I want to talk about uh, and fly through is uh, our browser organizations in Revit. And the first thing I want to talk about is BIM with integrity. What the hell does that have to do with browser organizations? Well, that's for you to put together. And what it really is coming from is the, the responsibility for your actions and the communication and documentation. If you want to assume people are going to do things right, your jobs are and your projects are going to be screwed up. And if you plan them, your jobs will not be screwed up. So if you actually take responsibility, take ownership. I mean, this is down at the, 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 the user level, at the intern level, all the way up to the owner of the company level. If anybody points a finger and says, you did it wrong, you did it wrong, I say, well, I say a lot of things, right? The consortium's going, you say, oh, they're an asshole. No, I say, you look inward, right? Hockey player loses a game because the referee missed a call or made a bad call. If that hockey player blames the referee, that hockey player, in my opinion, I shouldn't have had two beers because I'm not going to say it, is a loser, not a winner, right? That hockey player should have said, what could I have done earlier to score more goals to where that bad call that's part of the game wouldn't have mattered? Do you want to be a professional or an amateur? And that's what we're talking about. That's what I'm talking about here. Do you want to be a at the top of your game, the best at your game, or do you want to be just, you know, the Sunday night guy that goes to the league and is like 20 pounds overweight and doesn't care, but, you know, it's he's having fun, but really, hey, for a little hockey league on the corner, that's awesome. Building architectural projects where we actually build buildings, that is inexcusable. And I mean all the way down. That's what I'm talking about, BIM with integrity. Have integrity for every action you do. Okay, that's what this is all about. The browser is a dynamic organization. There's a lot of things, you know, that we can take into account, and we have to plan a lot. I, if anybody's seen any other presentations I've done, I've spoken and used, um, you know, quotes from Dwight Eisenhower and all these people from history that are awesome, talking about planning is essential. A good plan is meaningless. It's the planning, it's the doing, actually doing and thinking and using your brain. Yes, disorganized projects are a recipe for disaster. If you got a disorganized project and it becomes successful, good for you. You got so lucky. You should probably convert to whatever religion is closest to you at that time because something made it happen and it was just a goof of luck, right? If you are a disorganized, AECO entity, and it is successful, it's just a goof, right? There's no way to do it. You got to plan. You got to have a mindset that says, you know what? I want this to be good. I intend this to be good. I'm, and then next time, I'm going to learn what I didn't do right, and I'm going to make that right next time. And then next time, I'm going to get better and better and better and better. And I do warn you, right, that an organized project can lead to success. So be warned. Really? Nobody? Nobody? <laughs> One? <laughs> One little laughter? Uh -huh. 
<laughs> Thank you, Cody. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> so we're going to talk about organizing views and organizing sheets. Organizing families is a huge undertaking, just the same, and is a conversation that we're not going to touch on, but that's in the browser, that's in the project, and that should be done. Um, so, you know, we want to, what, the concept of what I do, and when you get the, the handout that are now posted on the blog, there are links over there, and you can download them. Funny thing, I put those links, or the, the actual PDFs, in a digital warehouse that I have, and not a minute later, two people had downloaded them already. I didn't post these links till 5.30 this evening, but somebody had already found them and downloaded them. So awesome for people. There are some people out there that are just scary digitally. But the handouts go through this and explain these parameters and explain what's happening with this stuff very in-depthly. I'm just going to fly through it. So the, the general workflow for view creation is you, and this is a rule, and people that are BIM managers and people that are project managers, they can, um, they need to embrace these things. Simple workflow. Every time you make a view, don't care what kind of view it is, every time, no questions asked. If you don't do this, I'm going to bring you into a conference room with your boss, close the door, and there's going to be a mean conversation, and it's going to show up in your review at the end of the year. You create a view, you name, rename, and parameterize the view. You do not do anything before you do those three things. Period. End of story. If you don't, you are going to make a mistake, and I am going to go over it as the BIM manager on the project, and I'm going to see that, and I'm going to put that in a report, and that report goes to your project manager, and that gets you roasted. It is the single laziest thing we can do, because it's the first thing. Simply naming it properly. Yes? Okay. See the, con see the handout for the uh, naming convention? I suggest a naming convention. It is nebulous. It is what I like. It's a very short naming convention. Because we have two things. We have, and this is, by the way, the interpretive dance portion of the proceedings. Project browser. If I am Revit, over here is the, how I do it is the project browser. And over here are the properties. And then the drawing area. So I'm like the drawing area. In the project browser, we want that name to be short because I don't want to stretch that window out. There is another parameter called title on sheet. That can be big. Floor plan, first level, building A, whatever. The name of the view doesn't want to be that. If, that. if that is the case in your firm or your world, you will never work on a project with me until you adopt a better convention. Okay? So, one of the things that we use, um, I like it. I learned this a long time ago. I wish I remembered the person, the first person that I saw this from. But it was an awesome idea, and I thought, wow, that's cool. I get it. If a name has all capitals, that goes onto sheets. If it's in modified sentence case, the word modified is because every big word has a capital first letter, like word of or and. It's called camel. It's called camel. Camel case. Camel case. I will start. I will put that in the next presentation. Um, so camel case or modified sentence case. That means it does not go onto a sheet. If you have a view and it's in camel case or modified sentence case and it's on a sheet, again, we're having a conversation in the room because you just don't get the fact that one means one and two means two. Basic things. Simple. Let's not reinvent the wheel every time. So that's what this con convention's all about. If it's all caps, we know that goes onto a sheet. If that view is onto a sheet, awesome. If it's in sentence case and it's onto a sheet, somebody made a mistake, now I have a red flag, i got to check this model really thoroughly because I don't know what else they screwed up. They can't even get a name right. You see what I'm saying? It's management. It's planning. It's trust. It's integrity. It's personal integrity. we got to have it. Okay? By the way, whenever you see this dialogue, always say yes. Who says no to this? Yes. Read it. <laughs> Other than Troy, who says no to this? 
You, you want to know why? There's two people? Let me tell you why. Why do we say no to that? Because MEP wants to have your level names, but my view names are different than your level names. Awesome. So other than Troy in MEP <laughs> that wants to take on my names, right, as an author, as the architect, or as the person who wants, I want the level name to be associated to specific views because we actually deal with those in this uh, convention a specific way. We keep them locked up here in these what are called associated views. They never go onto sheets. They are never annotated. Nobody ever owns them. Actually, shh, don't tell these guys. I don't know if they can hear this. Where's the microphone? Right there, you're looking at it. I tell the project managers to open these views because they're never going to go onto sheets. Oh, you want to mess with the model? Go to there. Go to the associated views. Nobody's ever going to do anything to them. Right? And the thing is, th these actually break the convention because d how many architects like to have the words in all capitals at the elevation and section markers? I know I do. Right? Of course. Yeah. Well, that breaks the rule because those aren't on sheets. So see, I have a convention that allows you to break the rules. Isn't that awesome? No? No awesomes? I like to break the rules. Come on. So what we do is with this organization, is you're going to maybe have a lot of different organizations. I'm going to, I use the linear list. Just show me every one of the views. I switch into these. I have all different kind of view um, organizations and sheet organizations. The main thing these days, when this original presentation was written, are these two shared parameters that I've created, heading one, heading two. I've seen all sorts of different names. It's basically just two parameters. What the name is? Meaningless. Except when you call them like view type, view class, view organization this, or view. Look, there's two headings. Yes, we all know what a heading is. There's a main heading, there's a secondary heading. So I just happen to call them heading one, heading two. <laughs> number one is primary, number two is secondary. Nothing magic about it. So that's the view. Did I just go backwards? How did I do that? That was awesome. What did I push? Now, in Revit 2013, anybody use Revit 2013? I know, I know everybody. Raise their hand. By the way, here in LA, there's like three people raising their hand. So when you guys want to laugh, you either laugh that people here don't want to participate by raising their hand, or nobody uses the new software. One of the two. That is throwing the gauntlet to all of you. Okay? I know a handful of people, at least in Europe, are just laughing like, oh my god, everybody didn't just raise their hand. So take that as a challenge. We have more architects in the city than any other um, city, I believe, in the world per capita, I think. Something like that. And really, there we're not could using be a the town with one architect in it and one person living in that town. There could well, yeah, no, there could be one of them. No, but like we have a lot of architects here. Yeah, all the big companies. And really, we're not like every one of us isn't leading the technology, we should be ashamed of ourselves. That's just a personal thought. <laughs> so there's also now in 2013 this thing called view types. Structural engineers, Troy, or um, sorry, Marcelo, are you here still? Uh, yeah, hello, Marcelo, you over there talking? How long has view, have view types been in uh, Revit structure? Yeah. Right click, duplicate, new view type. Wasn't it structure? It's been there for a while. Yeah, it has been. Which one has been? That one. See, no, 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 not, no, not that's duplicate. But view types, I believe, have been in structure. And there's like, I think Steve Stafford's out there. If he's watching, he's screaming, going, yeah, "It's been in there for four years, or whatever." It is. Um, but I believe structure has had view types for quite a while now. Architecture just got it in 2013, so you can right click. You know, it says plan views. Yes. Floor plans, yeah? You can right click on that and say duplicate. Plan views, oh my god. Core and shell, interiors. Immediately, I have two different view types. So we can parse out the work. We can organize this browser in such a way that I don't get the interiors people messing with the core and shell people's views 
they know exactly, they can minimize that little checkbox and just have that one expanded and have even more granular control over what they see and are working on. So if anybody doesn't know about view types in 2013, when you get to projects that are using 2013, because realistically, even though I was a little bit of an a-hole before calling us all out about not using Revit 2013, I get it. I mean, I'm still on projects that are using 2010. That's when we started. Nobody wants to upgrade. We're going with it. You know, so I get it. But when you start doing projects in 2013, utilize the view types. If you have a BIM manager that doesn't know what view types are, doesn't utilize those in your project template, go to them and say, listen, let's start using the view types. Don't just say, let's start using them, though. Bring a solution. These are the 10 view types I think we need to have. Thank you very much. See you next month. You know, and let them deal with it, but bring them a solution. Integrity, solutions, planning. Don't just say, that's wrong. That helps nobody. Okay? Bring a solution. This is one of the things why I am so amazed and happy that I have this consortium to run this user group is because these people do not just bring ideas as ideas abstracted from reality. They bring, so, hey, I have this idea, and here's how it should be in my mind. Right? Solution. Possible solution. We might not go with it. We might change it, but there's a, at least one way to kind of start traveling. Wow, I just, I found that button that I couldn't find before, and now I don't know which one it is I'm hitting. In your, uh, so why is organization important? Anybody? Bueller? 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 Anybody? It's on the screen. Anybody? Yell it out. Why is organization important? Success. Marcelo? Because you want to be successful, don't you? Organization, is that not one of the keys to success? Knowing where to find something when you need it at that moment and not having to search through a list of things. Oh my god, who else has had this in a project browser before I give the floor art? There's no organization. It's just floor plans, RCPs, sections, elevation. And the naming convention, oh, there may even be a half-baked naming convention. And then there's that one user that just likes all capital, or all uh, lowercase. And then there's the other user that likes half capitals, half uppercase, half lowercase, half who knows what else they're using. Anybody else have seen that? I know every one of you has. They name them after, well, those are user views. That's okay. Oh, not user views? No, just, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Views that are named after yourselves when they're not intended to specifically be for yourself. Like they go onto sheets, but they're named for themselves. Jay's super plan view. <laughs> I'm going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to go rename. We're going to write a script. I'm going to go rename all these views and just do it under the hood. And what? What? I don't know. I don't know what happened. Try to find, you know, throw your socks into one pile and try to find the two blue ones out of all the black ones. Or put them in an organized manner. Who's going to find their socks first? I'm going to be out partying. You can find your socks in that pile or wear two different colored ones doesn't matter to me. So that's really what I'm talking about. This presentation does not show, well, not one thing. It does, it had a couple screenshots that I think were from the actual handout. But the handout, I believe, is about 15 pages. And it walks through all of those parameters and all of that stuff step by step. I know we did talk about, uh, I did mention that we were going to, I was going, we, when I say we, I mean I almost every time, just so you guys know that. Your multiple personalities. Exactly. The we is me. Um, was going to talk about view templates, but um, somebody, somebody took a lot of time, so I can't talk about view templates tonight. So we will get back to that. And... I know you don't. You have no time to speak. Thank you, Marcelo. Not at all. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, there's no more time because we do want. I understand. We do want need to get to uh, Troy and Elisa's, and I would rather not step on them too much. So view templates and Marcelo's little trying to jab me in the side will have to come at a later time. 
So thank you guys very much for being part of this. And next, we will give you two or three questions. Troy Gates, after two or three questions. You've got to have questions. OK. So are there questions from any of you regarding the project browser, other than relating to this picture, because I stole it from the internet. I don't know what site. Sorry. No questions? Wow. Marcelo? Question? No. Do you have any questions whatsoever? OK. <laughs> Please come here. So I don't have to repeat the question, because we need to repeat the question for posterity. <laughs> no, for the, wait. Is it? All right. See the eyes. Yeah, that's the right. question. Okay. Can you please explain your workflow for using view templates when you bring in views and models from other consultants into your architectural workflow? Okay. So, so what I hear you asking no, is it's not a question. Yeah, I want you to explain it, and then the question will generate. Oh, I see. You'll you'll generate the question. Right. Okay. So in view templates, what I have done in the past is, and and in the present on projects is. I have paperwork where I have captured um, in text files, actually not text files, they're actually very graphic. They look just like the project browser. From, I'm sorry, the um, object styles look just like the object styles. So it has all those fields and all the subcategories and the color of the objects. and I mean, it is, it's just captured out into something where we can input text. Okay? And we have a, this document that has plan, column for plan, after all that, it has a column for plan, it has a column for RCP, it has a column for section, it has a column for elevation. There is one that has all of the architect's objects, both model and annotation. There is another that has all of the structural engineers, model and annotation objects. There is another for the MEP engineers, all of their model and all of their annotation objects. We make copies of that. And we share it. And at the kickoff meeting, we say, OK, Mr. Structural Engineer, Mrs. Structural Engineer, whatever the case may be. I'm not calling you a Mrs., Thank but I, that's why I said Mr. and looked away for Mrs. Um, tell me, in the architectural and in the MEP world, what you want in your model when you bring our models in, what you want on and off. And you go through and you highlight what you want off, and you leave blank what you want on. So you're actually only highlighting that which you don't want to see. You could do it the other way. That just happens to be how I set up this stuff. We name the views a certain way. So we actually each create a view for a plan, an RCP, section, elevation, for structural, and for MEP. That's as an architect. As the structural engineer, they would create the same for architecture and for MEP the MEP would create for structural and architecture. Then what happens is when we get to sharing the project files, I link in the MEP and the structural. I don't have to go in and do all those visibility changes. I don't have to go into all those object styles buried in the links. I just have to simply use this specific linked view. And since we've talked about it at a kickoff meeting, I'm going to trust that they actually turn those things on and off because they have shared back that paperwork saying, this is what we gave, this is what you asked for, this is what we've created. If you change your mind, we'll deal with that later, but this is what I, I gave you what you asked for, you gave me what I asked for, we all have a paper trail. What I like about that, I guess let me, we'll, we'll let the question come because that will lead me into what I like about that workflow as opposed to not doing that work. Okay. So that's the workflow. You make views for me, I make views for you. And you use those as linked and views. And I use those as linked views and I push that around via view templates and say use those linked views. So all my plans that I want to see structure in, I make a specific view template. I have all sorts of different view templates. Sometimes I'll have a view template that just pushes scale. I want all these different kinds of views. I don't care what kind of views they are. I want these 137 views to go to 8th inch equals a foot. 
I want to do it. I want to be easy. So I'll create, go create a quick view template that has everything off except eighth inch scale. So I have all these different view templates, and one view template would be specific to that change. So in your okay, so in your workflow, you have a view template that says all it says is change the view based on this linked view settings. Right? Change the structural model based on the structural model's linked view setting to okay. that specific linked view. Okay, so here's my question. This is scripted, but I asked this question last night. He's like, you got to ask that. Right. It's scripted. Wait, let me read off the script. Okay, so my question is, why set the responsibility on the consultant or whoever you're working with to create individual link views in their model that has everything turned off when you could, on your end, as the prime or, or whatever you want to be linking in, why don't you take it upon yourself and your responsibility to take the view template and turn off all the things that you don't want to see, say for structural, you want to see structural columns, you have a view template that says, okay, instead of going by link view, I take my view template and say, turn everything off except the structural columns. You apply that to the structural model that you have in, and then you get in your view just structural columns based on a view template that you set up in your office and the consultant didn't have to do anything, any extra work, and create any views, link views on their end. Yes. What that that's what I want to know. Why are you why doing are we, that? Why are yes. you giving why is that work? Your yes. Okay. Does everyone understand that question? Mm -hmm. Yes. So when Marcelo asked me that, it immediately dawned on me. Oh crap. Hmm. Why do I do that? And and I really had to think about it. I didn't think along. But I did think about it, and through our conversation, I thought about it more and more. And and I think the thank you. The initial question, how we raised it, was, do you do we have to do it? I think was the first yeah. kind of way you framed it. We're like, do you do do you have to do it that way? And the bottom line answer is, no, absolutely not. Honestly, no, you do not have to do that. There is no benefit. Well, we'll get to that. That was actually a little misspoken. There is no difference at the baseline if I do it myself or the engineer does it themselves and I use the link view. As long as the right stuff is on and off, I'm golden, right? We're all good. That's the bottom line. If I create these, if you create them, if the consultants create them, doesn't matter who creates them. So the original, you know, and I told Marcelo, I was like, you know what, at the bottom line, no, there's no reasoning. There's, there's just no difference. There's no difference. There is a reason. There's no difference. Why I still like it, whether we actually do it or not on projects, is because what happens is, damn, was somebody changing the slides on me? Where's that success slide? Get back to that success oh, slide. You're back to questions. I don't care, man. Oh, you went to the question slide. I got you. Thank you, bud. Then thank you. I apologize. I apologize. Wait a second. Because I want success. Whether or not we use that method, what happens is early on we have a conscious discussion about what will be on and off. And if we all choose to use that method where we do create these linked views, we are I am now as an architect mindful of what this structural engineer needs to see on and off. I am mindful of what the, you need to listen to this, by the way, you need to be hearing this, right? I am mindful of what the structural engineer is doing. They are mindful of what I'm doing. I'm mindful of what you're doing. You're mindful of what I'm doing. And if there is no other benefit beyond we are all now thinking about one another, that's good enough for me because this is, I'm getting right back to that team player sport. We are in a team game here, and until we play like a team, we are going to be less and less and less successful. So if for all, no other reason than that, I still, I'm still grasping onto that. I'm not so tight, and I don't think there's a real you know, baseline difference. And if an architect yelled at you for doing that, I think they need to reevaluate. But um, that would be my reasoning for wanting to use it. So. Thank you very much. Uh, question? Um, yes, the young lady in black. You can't create a view template 
when you don't have links in it to turn nah. on and off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there, there, that's a question. Yes, you cannot create view templates if you don't already have a link. So that gets to a presentation that we don't have time for. That's like another two hour. What's that? Whole presentation on view templates. Yes, and, and when we talk about view templates, there will be a whole discussion on using project templates and using, I'm going to say, bullshit file, I mean bogus files, placeholder files that hey. actually have, I, hey. I can say what I want, my sandbox right now. Using project templates or using central files saved as and dot dot dot. So that question needs to be when we have a larger venue in a lot more time because that's a whole two hour presentation. And I think Troy and I discussion, discussion, fist fight, whatever. So there's completely two distinct viewpoints, and they both have valid. So with that, Troy Gates, you have your floor. Who's going to run this? Thank you very much. You, you need me to? To this. That'll be Joe. Okay, Joe, can you run it at least for now? I got to get. <laughs> Um, yeah, let me get up to the PowerPoint. Here. Do you want to so. All right, so welcome everybody again. Um, so I'm Troy Gates. I'm the Design Technologies Manager for uh, Mazzetti, Nash, Lipsy, and Birch. Uh, we're an MEP firm um, based out of San Francisco. I work in a small office here in Irvine, uh, and I've been associated with LA Rug for a long time, as, as Jay introduced us. Um, and so I wanted to talk about schedules. Schedules to me are very essential to Revit projects. Um, a lot of people use them enough, but not enough. And so that's why I kind of came up with the idea of beyond the initial creation, you need to know how to do some things in schedules to make them better than just saying, pick this category, pick a few parameters, and put it on a sheet. So um, I came up with a few things. If this goes over here. So I came up with a few things that I thought would kind of help you get your schedules to where they're a little bit better than just going through the initial steps. So I'm going to go through some what I call appearance tricks. They're things that I've kind of come across over the years that have made schedules work better that you can't really do what I would say out of the box or out of the template. They're kind of tricks you have to know in order to accomplish this stuff. So like putting symbols in a schedule. Um, did anybody even here know that you could put a symbol in the schedule? Yes. One. Great. We have one person. So um, this is one that I don't think very few people know either, how to put a second line or a new line in your header. So I'm going to go through that. Some custom titles. I am going to hit view templates for schedules. Marcelo. View templates for schedules. Uh, no. Uh, just view templates. Uh, talk about copy paste, but then I wanted to go through three specific actual tools that are in schedules um, that I, again I don't think people really have have looked too far into them because they're using schedules very basic. So most of mine is not going to be PowerPoint. Obviously, I'm already questioned. So that was one slide. Okay. All right. So before we get started, looks like we lost. Uh, the computer screen, so let me get it back on to the Google Hangout. Back up here. I think it goes to sleep and it asks you if it's going to come up. Right. 
So back. All right. So most of mine is going to be in a rabbit because you can't really talk about schedules unless you show schedules. So the first things I'm going to go through are my appearance tricks here. Uh, actually, let's go back to this other one. So the f the first one is about symbols, and I will just do it here in. Where's my? Sorry. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is go through uh, how to put a symbol into your schedule. So I'm just in a very simple building here. You can see I have a lot of schedules. Uh, I've just kind of added them here. I'm just going to do a quick room schedule. Get to rooms here. And this doesn't really matter what I'm, as far as what I'm putting in, but I'm just going to put in an extra column here. So I'm going to do room number and name, but I'm going to add a new parameter in here. It's just called delta, just to put a, a symbol in here. And just so you know, it has to be a text parameter, because what we're going to be putting in is text, even though it's a symbol. Okay. So here's a very simple um, schedule, but I want to put in a delta symbol here. So inside of Windows, there is a tool called Character Map. So the way you get to it is if you go to Start, and I'll just type it in here. If you start typing Character Map, it comes up with this program called Character Map. And since my project uses Arial as the text, I need to make sure that that's the same font that I'm using in the character map. Because everything that's in here are the characters that are in that font map. Okay, So if you're using a different font type for your schedules, you need to make sure and pick that font type. And based on the font type, you will have different symbols. So what I'm going to do is scroll down here, and there is a delta symbol in here. I can find it. So. Here is a symbol that I want to put into a schedule. So I can click on that and say select it, hit copy, and then I can jump over to Revit and use the keyboard shortcut of Control V and paste that in. And then hit enter, and now I have a symbol in my schedule. So you're limited to what's in the character map, but based on the font, there could be a ton of symbols in here that you could be putting in. Okay, so you can use this to put it check mark, you can use it to put solid dots, whatever you want to signify so you have a more graphical um, schedule. Okay, And that's all it takes is just picking on the one you want. Um, so let's say I wanted a dot. I'm going to clear this one out by hitting backspace and just say select, copy, come over here, click in a cell, control V, hit enter, and now I have that symbol in there. So it's a quick way to get some kind of graphical symbol in there. Okay, So that's one trick. So the next trick, let me jump to my slide here, make sure I get them in order, is a new line in the header text. Okay. So a lot of times you want to, well, let me go to a, a schedule here to show you a good example. So I have down here, um, so I have rooftop unit schedule for MEP. So I have a lot of headers here. And maybe I want to have, for instance, this one have the CFM on the next line below it. So it's OA at the top and CFM below it. Well, in order to get Revit to do it, I have to make this column really small. And you can see it's not really giving me that, right? Well, in here, if I click it to edit this, there's a trick where if you hit Shift and hit Enter, it will actually give you a new line. So if I do Shift and Enter and then Enter again, and I have to have a new field in here to fill this. Okay. So if I do shift enter, and it's not going to do it live. <laughs> so it does work. So I have one here that's working. Okay. So like these ones right here. So I actually did shift enter in there, and it moved it to the next line when I was typing it. Let's see if I type it out here live. So if I do shift enter, you can see how it moved down to the next line. And then I can type CFM. And that allows me to do a whole new line in that in that cell. 
And this works in any parameter field anywhere in Revit. So you can actually do it in tags too. It's not just limited to schedules. So Revit knows, and it's actually based on Windows, that shift enter means do a new character line in that single line um, object. So it allows you to put in multiple lines. Okay. So that's another trick. This allows you to get some nice looking, you know, like this one. I didn't want it to have motor HP all the way out. I wanted it motor and HP below it. So I used that shift enter to move it down below it. Okay. Um, how many people know how to do this, where you can take two cells and add another one above it? Okay. A few people. So in order to do that, what you have to do is just select multiple cells. And there's a button up here called group. And that allows you to have a whole other line above it. So you can put some text here. Okay. So you can actually combine cells and put another level of text above it for the header. So you can kind of group things together so I can get things like this where these cells or parameters are all associated together as span data. Okay. All right. So next is custom titles. This one um, is, is using schedules and groups to actually get the appearance that I want. So I'm going to drag one of these schedules on and place it. So you can see I don't have the title of the text or the title of the schedule on there. And so what I did was I went in here to the appearance and I said don't show a title. I don't want a title showing. I'm going to create my own title. So in our template what we do is with all of our standard schedules we go in and we create a group based on how we want the title to look. So when I go back over here to the sheet, I have one called Schedule Air Handling Unit. I can just drag that and place it, and now I have a custom title across the top of my schedule. Okay? Schedules by default put the text in the middle, right? Center. Well, I didn't really like the way that looked, so I really wanted to make it where it, throwing back to our CAD standards from before Revit. We always put our text on the left, left justify. So the only way to really do that was for me to create this. So all it is is a group. If I edit this group, you can see it's just line work and text. That's a text object. These are pieces of line. I take all of that. After I draw it, I say add it to a group. When it's in the group, I move the um, origin point to the front of it, and then that automatically will snap to a schedule when you bring it in. So when I bring this in, you can see that since that's where the base point is, it will actually grab the, the top left endpoint of the schedule and snap to it. So you can get some nice looking schedules laid out on your sheets. Okay? Yeah, question over there. Does it modify the table? So the question was, does the group modify itself when you shrink the table or the schedule? No. So you would have to modify that group. So what we did is we create all of our schedules in our template, and we make sure that they're the right way we want them to look, and then we create the groups based on that. But if, for instance, you have a project where you needed to add a couple of them, it's as easy as just going in after they're together and selecting the group and editing it and moving the line to the end of it and then saving the group. And then it would be the same size as the schedule. So in this case, if I was to go in and, and say just – on this remarks field, say it wasn't long enough and I wanted to extend it right now, it's not the same. So all I would do is just edit the group, come in and take this line here at the end and move it. And since it will snap to um, the schedule, I can just do endpoint to endpoint and then uh, finish the group and now it'll, it'll match it. Okay. But because the you don't change the size of the columns in the schedule, you change them on the sheet, you see it when it happens. The only way you wouldn't see it is if you added new columns. And then you would just have to make sure that you catch it when you print it, obviously. Okay? Right? Um, so the last one isn't really a trick. It's just something that I've seen that a lot of people didn't know is that you can apply view templates to schedules. So when you go through a schedule, let me just take this one here and edit it. When you go through a schedule and set up the appearance, 
and get that appearance how you want. Well, you can't duplicate a schedule to another category, but you want all your schedules to look the same, right? So you can go in and set up one how you want, and then you can actually set up a view template for it. That way you can apply that view template to all your schedules so they all have the same appearance when they go on your sheets. So it's as easy as just saying create a, uh, a view template and apply it, and then you can go in and select all your view templates and apply that. And with 2013 now, um, if you don't know, view templates are associated to the view, so if you change the view template, it will automatically change the views now, where before you had to go back and reapply it. So now it's a live connection. Keep changing those view templates, and it'll keep changing all the views that are associated with that. And so the last trick I wanted to show, which, again, I, I don't think a lot of people know, is that you can copy-paste schedules between projects. And it's as easy as just right-clicking on a schedule, copying to clipboard, going into another project, hitting Control-V. All of those, um, all the... Um, layout of the schedule will automatically go in there. The data won't go because the objects aren't going with it. So if you had a door schedule and you had 20 doors in it, it's not going to take those 20 doors with it, but the layout of your schedule is going to go. And then if there's doors in that other schedule, it, they will automatically show up in there because it's pulling that live data. So it's a nice way if you have a schedule that you built in a project and you want to get it into your template, copy and paste it into your template and you're done. You don't have to go in and recreate it. Okay, and you just have to make sure you have them both open in the same version of or in the same session of Revit, because that's the only way Revit allows you to copy paste between. Okay, so that's really kind of my tricks on getting kind of your schedules to look a little bit better, work a little bit better. Except like they're not really out of the box. Okay, so now. Uh, what I want to do is talk about key schedules real quick. So I'll raise a hands. How many people know what a key schedule is? Maybe half. Maybe. So a key schedule. Come on, everybody that's new, raise two hands. All right. So a key schedule is what you can think of as like a lookup table. It's a schedule that's not associated to individual objects, but it will pull data from that schedule and apply them to objects when you tell it to. Okay. So let, I have an example here that I built a long time ago, which is for um, plumbing fixtures. And what it does is it uses the CDC or the CPC to calculate based on your room area and the type of room, how many plumbing fixtures you need. So what I've done is I went in and built some key schedules that have all of the code in. So for the CDC plumbing code, here's the group type. So this is telling you what is um, an assembly, an A, A1 or A2, business, education, etc. And then based on that, what's the load factor? So I just took straight out of the code book and built it into a schedule. These aren't built into objects. Okay. So let me show you how you build those. So pretty much you just do a new schedule since these are going to be applied to rooms, because I want to calculate based off of a room area how many fixtures are needed for that room, I need to do my, my key schedule based on rooms. So I'm going to come in here and choose room. Okay, And it's just as a matter of just clicking the second um, radio button here that says schedule key. And what I can do is give it a key name. In this case, my key name in this one was the assembly, because these are what are unique that identify the data that's going to be stored in there, okay? So you have to have one column that's kind of the identifier. And once you have that identifier, you can go in and add um, all the fields you want. So the key name here is my assembly group type. And then I have um, the load factor, which is, you know, how many square feet per, per, per person do I need for a fixture? And then I have notes also. So where I use that now is if I go in here to my schedule, so for instance, these are all the rooms that are in this project. This group type now, see how they all say none? That means it's looking to that key schedule. 
And the way you do that is you just add that parameter in. So that parameter was called this one right here, this CVC load factor. That was the parameter name that's linking the key schedule, which was the A1, A2, and et cetera. I put that same parameter in here. And so what you can see is as soon as I click in here, I have those now available. So if I click on one of these, you can see it automatically puts in the load factor. The occupants, and this one happens to be a formula, which I'll show you in a second. But what it's doing is it's taking the area and the load factor and figuring out how many uh, occupants can be in that area based on this code. So I can go in here to office, for instance, and say, well, maybe this is it's a business, so I need to put in that. You can see it automatically grabs the 200 square feet. Because if we go back to this one, you can see B for business is 200 square feet. So you can create these lookup tables that you use in your schedules to fill out information very quickly that's preset information. Otherwise, how would you do this before? Somebody would go in and type each one of these, right? So you have someone typing one. Well, what if they mistype? Or what if it changes? What if somebody decided that this was going to change? Then they have to retype all of these. If it's a key schedule, I can change one parameter. So I'll just make this one E1. You can see it automatically changes. So that key schedule is driving the data now in my regular schedule. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, there is um, the, the, the documents that we put online. So after this, we go to um, the LA Rug blog. It has more information about how to do this. Actually, I have linked to Autodesk Wiki Help, which has a lot of information step by step how to go through and create these. Okay. But as you can see, they're really powerful. And in this one, actually, I've gone as far as actually defining the water closets and the lavatories. So you can actually go in here, and these are based on these. So for instance, the water cl um, closet for females, here's the code. I actually went in and typed all of this out so that people don't have to type this in every project. They can just pick which it is. So they could go in and say, well, based on the group type and the occupancy that it's found, they can then put that in, and it will automatically figure out how many fixtures it needs. So if I come up here, for instance, and say, okay, based on this, this auditorium can have roughly 89 people in it. So let's say I wanted fixed seats. I'll just put zero for this one. So there's 89.9 total occupants for that auditorium. Well, for the male, I know it's an auditorium, and it's between 76 and 125. So I pick that, and you can see it automatically says, I need three male water closets based on that auditorium alone. So I can now make my BIM project, or my model, intelligent. That's adding the eye to it, right? It's now doing stuff for me that I didn't have to go in and do by hand. And that's the power of schedules, making it do the information for you instead of someone typing it in and making sure that they knew what they were doing versus letting Revit figure it out for you. So just to kind of show the behind the scenes on this uh, in the fields, so the area right here is a built-in area for rooms. All rooms have an area. So to get what the, um, the occupants are, it's a matter of just taking the area and dividing it by that load factor that I'm pulling from the key schedule. So the area divided by uh, load factor automatically populates in here what the occupants are. And then to get the total occupants, because code allows you to put in fixed seats, that's part of it. But the total occupants, if you look at this one, is the area occupants plus the fixed occupants is going to give you the total occupants. And then, unfortunately, you can't really drive this one from that, so you just have to look it up on your own and say, all right, 89 is between 76 and 125, so I'm going to select that. And then I can go through here and just select each one of these to represent that. And you can see that it still fills out my, um, my schedule here. Okay. Question. So unfortunately, you cannot do an if-in. Um, you can do an if, um, and actually I'm going to be doing uh, next month, uh, I'm going to be doing um, a presentation on a lot of formulas and how to drive parameters based on formulas. But unfortunately, you can't do an if based off of another parameter 
and say if that equals something, then do this. Um, so yeah, so unfortunately you can't, but and that's why I'm driving driving it like this and allowing you to choose based off of what you see. Uh, another area that unfortunately Revit doesn't allow you to do it is because rooms are um, system families. You can't do formula-based shared parameter, parameters, so I can't automatically put this total occupants into a tag. Um, so I actually have a schedule called occupancy tag management that goes through and automatically finds the information for you, but then I create another column which is actually the one that goes into the tag, and you have to type it out by hand to get show up in the tag. But you do have it here. So for instance, if I put in um, that this is auditoriums and then I put in seven here and the occupancy here, then it would show up in my tag. So let me just actually do that and show you on the floor plan. Well, let me uh, show you the floor plan first. So see, this is the auditorium tag. It's driving the area because that's built in. So you can put that in a tag. But this tag, um, let me just show you you have these labels that are the occupancy class which is a shared parameter but it's called occupancy class tag because I can't grab that parameter from the room because they just don't let you so you have to type it in but by having that schedule here I can go in and type these so for instance if I put 386 in here and I go back you can see now that that 386 shows up in there so it's a manual process uh, I'm hoping it's something that Revit can do in the future where you can say if this parameter is this, make it this, but you can't write it. Uh, I know it's something you could definitely do through programming the API, but that would obviously take someone writing some code that would look at the data and then push it into that other parameter. And you would have to run that app every once in a while. Okay? So going back to the, to the key schedules here, um, I was going to cover another one, and I was a little hesitant to do it at first because it's kind of a workaround, but it's creating schedules that aren't database. They're not based on the model. They're free-form schedules that don't reflect your model in one way or the other. I don't know. I don't know how much time you're going to give me. How much time do you want? Uh, give me at least 10 more minutes. Okay. Well, what's 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 our end time? Ten minutes. No, that's all. Don't let me interrupt. Okay. So I, I just, I'll just show it real quick. So key schedules can be free form schedules, and the reason I didn't really want to say it is because Jay wants all of your information to be live based off your model information. Unfortunately, in the real world, sometimes we have to have schedules that aren't based on objects. Oh yeah. Okay, so I actually do have some schedules that are that way. So I just wanted to show you a few of the schedules that we have that way. Um, so this is a feeder schedule for, for our electrical drawings. These aren't based on objects, and we, we put this in on our own, but we need it as a schedule. So before coming up with this way of doing it, we did it in CAD and just put it into a legend and then put it on the sheet. Well, that means you have to edit it in CAD, reinsert it, update it, whatever, and then use it. Well, by using a key schedule, you can create an unlimited number of rows. It's not based on objects. So I can come in here and add as many rows as I want and type anything I want into each of these rows. So it gives me a freeform schedule, not tied to objects, doesn't change your model at all, and then I can put it on a sheet. So it does allow you some flexibility in creating a schedule that's not based on your model. Okay? And I like it better than having to do it in CAD and bring it in. Okay? And the same way that I can add, I can also delete rows. So it's just going to say it's going to delete it. Uh, actually, this is a trick a lot of people don't know. You can actually select multiple rows to delete. If you just click and drag, it actually selects the rows, and then you can delete. <coughs> and it's going to tell you it's going to delete line of them. I actually found that out on accident just by accidentally dragging one time and it highlighted multiple rows. So uh, it doesn't, it's not obvious that you can do that. Okay. So moving on to the next one, um, 
Conditional forming, I'll just talk about um, real quick, and then I'll actually show an embedded schedule ones. So conditional formatting, I'll just show you where it's at. It allows you to go in and highlight a, 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 a column or a parameter in a schedule based off of a condition. So I'll just go in here, and this is actually my embedded one. Um, I'll just do it in here. So it, when you go into um, formatting, you have a button called conditional format. I think prior to 2012, only MEP had it. I think now everybody has it. Um, you can go in, and what conditional format does is allows you to take one of um, the parameters that are in your list. Let me grab a schedule here that has more in it. Uh, let me do it in here. Okay. So in here, if I go into formatting, and I say, okay, I want to highlight one of these cells based off of um, some parameter. And I'll actually do area. So I'm going to go in here to conditional format. And I'm going to say if the area is, and you can see all the choices here. Let's say if the area is less than, um, what can we choose, 100 square feet. Okay, Make it red. And you can pick any color you want in here. And then I say okay and okay. And of course, I didn't do it. Let's see what I did in here. Oh, let me clear it. I had a previous one in there. So I'm going to go in here and say if area is less than 100 square feet, make it red. And of course, it's not doing it. Um, well, oh, it's. Not sure why it's not working, but what it should be doing is coloring any area fields here that are under 100 square feet in red. Maybe I have to put in, no, the square foot is there. Um, but it, sh it should be coloring in these two as red, highlighting that those don't meet your condition. No, it was the right one. Well, let me see what the area is. Yeah, you can see it's area. They're all area. Let's do less than or equal to, just in case. And let's make it red. There you go. Okay. So it's telling you if those don't meet a certain criteria, highlight them. And then if those ones, um, let me actually split view this here. So if I open up level one and split it, and get rid of this one. So if I come in here, and I'm just going to take this wall and move it to enforce this room on the bottom to be less, you can see the one on top automatically, it now meets that condition, so it's no longer red. So as you edit the model, okay, you can see that it, it either meets or doesn't meet the requirement of the condition, and you know that you need to go fix it. So a good case for this one would be, let's say you have a programmed area and then you have an actual area. If your programmed area isn't equal to your actual area, then maybe you want to highlight that. Okay. So the easy way to do that would just say program area minus area or area minus program area, whichever way you want to do it. And then you can go in and set a condition that says if it's greater or if it's zero or less, which means it's negative, then highlight it. That means you didn't meet your program area. If it's more, then you met it or more. So you could actually set it up in certain different cases to actually automate this so you know if you're doing what you want to do in your schedule. Okay. Can you set it up with a formula where you could make it like a percentage if it's more than 10% off? So you can't do a formula. The question was can you do it based on a formula? You can't do the formula in the condition other than what it gives you in here. So like for instance area, you can see it gives me these. Or um, if I do name, you can see it's actually very limited, equal to or not equal to. So based on the type of field it is. But you can create a parameter that's a formula based off of other parameters. So like I said, if, if I had an area and I had another parameter that was our program requirements, and then I could have a third parameter that said subtract one from the other. And if they're equal, it's going to be zero, right? If it's negative, that means that um, if I did area from program, 
then that means my area is too small. Or too, if it's above zero, it means it's too small. If it's negative, it means I'm good. So based on how you do the formula, you, can, you would adjust your condition for that. But yeah, then it would automatically highlight. And then as you're changing your model around and changing your room sizes, it would automatically check every time the condition and either change the color back to red or remove the color based if it meets the, the, the criteria. Okay. Um, this is another area that I'm hoping that Revit does allow us in the future to actually go in and write detailed, um, like multiple parameter formulas just within the conditional. Then you wouldn't need that other parameter. You could just say, if this one minus this one is greater than this, highlight it or don't highlight it. Okay. So the last area I wanted to show um, was doing embedded schedules. And I actually had one open up here. Um, so I have this one. This is new in, in 2013. It allows, well, for, for architecture and structure, it's new. Uh, MEP has had this again for, for a, a couple of releases. But what it allows you to do is do a schedule of objects within another schedule of objects, which is what they refer to as an embedded schedule. So what you do is you create a schedule based on either rooms, spaces, um, I believe electrical equipment, um, mechanical equipment. There's a few different categories. I have it in the document so you can see it. Um, but there's, there's not a lot of them. So if you do uh, a schedule based on a, a category and there's no embedded button, it means that that one isn't allowed. Okay? But in this case, I did rooms, so I automatically get this embedded schedule. So I can go in here. By default, it was off, so you would just come in and check it. And then you go in and pick from the list of categories that it gives you that are available. In this case, I said I wanted to see all the different pieces of furniture listed per room. And so I just picked furniture, clicked on embedded schedule, because um, I turned it off and erased them, so let me open it up again. And I said, I want the type and how many. Okay, pretty simple. So I just did that, hit OK. And what it did is it added the number and the name are the original room schedule. The type and the count are the embedded schedule of the furniture. So you can see it's pulling out for room one auditorium, it found this furniture with that many of them. Okay, so if I go in here again and um, open up the floor plan and, and split these again, so if I come in here and add a, a new piece of furniture, so let's pick one that's different. Okay, so if I go in here and grab this one and place it, you can see it automatically added that there's a new one of those. And so it's automatically adding more pieces of those furniture to that room. And so it, it's really nice to go in. I also did like a, a fixture one. So it has the room number and the room name and then the fixture, the plumbing fixtures that are in it. So in this case, we only have two restrooms, but you can see we have the family, the type, and the count for the different types of plumbing fixtures in those. So you can get some nice data about your rooms or your spaces about what's in them without having someone to have to go and look at it. So imagine if you're doing healthcare and you have a medical room that has you know, 50 pieces of equipment in it, I don't have to go out and look at all those pieces of equipment in it. I can do a schedule that limits it to just that one room by using a filter. Okay. So for instance, let's say I wanted to limit this to just room five. I can go in and hit this filter and say filter by room number. I want it to only show room number five in this schedule. I now have a schedule that is specific to that one room with all the equipment that's in that one room. I can then duplicate this schedule for every single room, change that filter to every room number, and now I have schedules for every single room in my, in my building with the furniture or the fixtures or whatever that's in it. Okay. MEP, we use this a lot for doing, you know, the lighting fixtures that are in a room, the electrical equipment that's in a room, um, data device, all that kind of stuff, so that we know what's in each room. Uh, and it's very quick to do. Question. Go back to the occupancy. Um, take out the room, and you have fixed seating and one and split in that room. Is there a way to break down this has one area, this has a different area? The project is going this You would have to do them as two separate rooms. Um, so, th so the question was, can you split standing from seating within one room within a, within a schedule? 
And uh, I mean, you could add that column, but it wouldn't do it automatically for you. Um, in mine, I have that fixed number. So if you saw that it had um, you know this fixed number in here, so I could say fixed seats, I could add one that says standing maybe, and I would have to calculate that on my own because it's only going to base it off of the area. But you could do two rooms and split it, um, but it would still be listed as two on, on the schedule. Okay, so one, one or two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, for the for schedules, if you, take, if you make a material schedule, can you have the chat the symbol of the material that's built into the schedule? So, so, go back. Yeah, so the question is can you have the, the material symbol in the schedule? I don't think you can. Uh, I, I don't think you can really do any kind of symbology in a schedule yet, but using groups, you could go in and do it by hand if you wanted. Uh, if you're just doing it for presentation purposes on the sheet, you could create a group and put a symbol of each one of those in front of the schedule um, row so it looks like it. Uh, we, we do that for um, for our keynotes. We like to put, you know, that it's circle one in the in the schedule. So we go in and just add the circles on top of the, the schedule ourselves just so it looks right. But it, it's not linked in any way. Did you use a schedule for all your um, I can't talk about that. Jay won't let me. We don't use keynotes. We use note blocks. So, yeah. yeah. Question. Can you schedule the revision sheets for, for, for revision date? Like, uh, say you revise, or you, you sent out the addendum one sheets, and you want to see how many sheets were included in the addendum one. So, so you want a schedule that only show that filters based off of the addendum? Only addendum uh, per day. So the the way that I'm doing that is I've created a separate parameter that we have to type in that it's part of that addendum. So what we've done is actually created a whole parameter for every single addendum. Share uh, uh, It could be a shared parameter or not. Uh, it could be just a project parameter. Um, but what it is is then you end up with your sheet. Uh, let's say you had 10 addendums, you end up with 10 parameters called addendum 1 through 10. And then that's where you could use that symbol, for instance, to put in you know, a box, a solid box or a solid dot to signify that they're part of that addendum. Um, so if you're doing you know, the multiple columns of which addendums those sheets are on, you know what I'm saying? Other than that, is there... There's no way to automate it, no. No, no it, it's manual input. Yeah, the, the revision schedule doesn't allow you to automate the parameters to the sheet to filter. So you couldn't filter a schedule based on what revision they're part of. No. It's a manual process. So I, I think I'm out of time. So um, thank you. I hope, I hope you guys uh, learned some of the tricks or learned some new ways to get your schedules to go further than, than just, you know, like I said, just you know, hitting a button, choosing parameters, and saying I'm done. Okay, so thank you. Okay, let me open it up. It's this mouse. Okay, hi everyone, my name's... Yeah, let me, let me okay, switch it to wait. you while I'm opening it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Elisa de Dios, I'm with um, AC Martin. I'm BIM manager and... Uh, Production coordinator, and um, I'm an associate at AC Martin. Been there about five years now. Um, we've been using Revit about five years now, but very slowly. So some of us are not on 2013 yet, but I'm being pressured to jump, so I will. <laughs> um, my topic today is model management and settings. It's not getting into what a BIM manager technically has to do, but some of that stuff is what BIM managers do, but most of it is what everybody should know that is going on in the project. It, it shouldn't be the type of thing that you shouldn't know how to do. It is typically what other people do. So um, if you go to the handout in the LA Rug blog, I go a lot deeper than I will in this PowerPoint. So. I can go. Yeah. Okay. Just click. So to get started, the first three things I want to talk about in model management is this right handed, left handed? Yeah. Okay. Warnings. And this is all I think. 
but not too far away. Thanks, so. I'll click it. I'm trying to, can I? OK, and work share warnings, model cleanup, and then going into work share models, because not everybody is technically in the work share model. And to start with warnings, and I did grab this from a project of mine. I didn't try and make it up. So I had 79 warnings, and looking at just these alone, they really, all of them should be gone. There's no reason why I should have a wall and a room separation line over each other, why multiple rooms are overlapping. So all of this does need to get cleaned up. Typically, there's somebody designated on the project that will open this up and go and try and go through them all. But there's also times when, as you see, you can actually, um, when you highlight it, you can see where it is, click it, show, and it'll take you into a view where that um, warning is. Another way to do it is if you actually highlight an object, if you notice your conceptual um, tab, will then show you if there's a warning with related to that, you can see it. So you can click on that, and then it'll show you what the warning is. It'll take you back to that other um, dialog specifically just to show you what is the problem with that wall and whatever else is with it. So you don't necessarily have to go to the warnings tab. You can actually see it when you select something. If it doesn't have a warning, then there would be nothing there. Another thing I like in model cleanup is deleting views that aren't being used. It's one of my pet peeves that people I have everybody make their own working views. All the plot views that go on sheets are not supposed to be technically worked on. You create your own working view with your name and then as people come in and out of the project, I usually go in once in a while and delete because I know, you know, Jeff isn't working on this anymore. He's been gone so I can go delete all of his views. Um, so basically the one thing I do is go to browser to the, highlight the views, change the type to not on sheets, and then from there I can see only the views that are not on sheets. And by looking at the name of it, I know whether it belongs there, whether it doesn't. I can kind of see that, okay, this is eventually going to belong somewhere. But another way uh, I do it is I create a view list where I actually go to a schedule and I only select family, view name, sheet number. And sheet number is what I use to filter my views. So I could say sheet number is less than 01 because I know in this project we have a 01 sheet, we have A. If you have, you know, your MEP sheets, you know it's just M, you can say it doesn't, ha it doesn't contain an M, so then you know it's not going to be part of your sheets. And then from there, I select family to sort by and I make it my header only because in my next view you'll see that um, forward backwards. I have views that this is my 3D view, that's what I call it, but if I don't give it a header I have no idea where that is if I just give the list of views. So that's the reason why under the family I give it, make that the header so I can see all of these scene plans, all of these 3D views. So this way I have a list here of what is not on a sheet. I leave the sheet number on and the schedule just as a secondary view to make sure, okay, it is blank, so these are not on sheets. Then I can go in there and I can go clean them out or leave them there if I know that eventually they're going to be used or it's a person's working view that they're constantly using. <laughs> Next thing I do is periodically I purge and audit my file. So I emphasize that this should be set on a schedule depending on your projects. It should be um, monthly, weekly, bi-weekly, it's up to you, but you should set a schedule because then you'll get in the habit of doing it. If you do it when people start complaining, then it gets in your way, then you're not, you're in the middle of something, you have to show somebody else how to do it type of thing. So that's why I always do this on a monthly basis. In the handout, I specifically say where a project is under 200 megabytes, I do it every month. And it's under it's six under six people. If I have more than six people on a workshop project, I do it weekly or bi-weekly. Because the more people that are in there, the busier it gets, the more issues you can have with corruption, with um, just all kinds of stuff, the more people that are in there. 
So the first thing I do is when I say open, I click on audit when I select my file. You're going to get this warning that's basically telling you, you know, you sure you want to do this? And it's telling you that you're going to be cleaning up this project. Next thing I do once the project is open is I go and purge. And as you see here, I have 200 items to purge. Um, I don't see that as a problem. I really don't need to go check and see what well, do I really want that gone, do I not want that gone. If they're not being used, they should be gone. Because we do have standard families. We do have you know, our library of, oops, I haven't used that light fixture tag yet, but I need it. You can go load it later. You really don't need to go through the whole list and keep everything up. <coughs> Lastly is once you have a worksheet file, once you've done the purge and the audit and the purge, you do have the option to compact the central model when you making the new one when you resave. It says slow, but with the hardware that we should be using nowadays, you know, 12, 16 gig of RAM, so forth, it doesn't take that long. So it isn't, let me click on this and come back in an hour. It's not, shouldn't be that long. If you do have that problem, then you'll know there's stuff going on in your file that, should be, that you're luckily getting rid of. Next is when you are in a worksheet file, I use worksets not only to bring in, okay, this is the link, my structural file, this is my MEP file, this is um, my CAD files. I use it also to separate the type of work. In this particular project, we have two interior sheets, one that's in-house, in one that isn't. So I do have my link for interiors, that's the outside people and then the people that are my in-house staff. And that way, it helps me to keep those views off where I don't need them because our in-house team is working in our same file. It's not a big enough project where we need to have separate files and we do need to constantly help each other out. So by doing it this way, I can just tell them you guys are working in your work set and you're only going to turn it on in the views you need it. By default, it's off in all of the typical production views. And I do the same thing with things like site work. We typically don't do a lot of site work, but <coughs> For whatever reason, if we have to do, like, say, a paving plan or something like that, it's, I'm only going to have it on in maybe two views. So by default, I'm going to keep it off. And lastly is um, having just the links. I do keep links in their own work set. It helps with um, loading. It helps with um, maybe I'm going to be working in an area where I really don't need to see the links. So when I do enter my file, I can say, don't open it. I don't need to see it. So that way it saves RAM and Revit doesn't have to keep thinking. So you can turn off whatever files that you really don't need to see and it'll make your model a little faster. Lastly, I want to talk about settings. Object styles, very basic, nothing crazy and you're going to go changing your company standards. Uh, line weights that apply to object styles and view templates, which I'm not going to get into 2013 because I'm not there yet or else I would like to get into that. With object styles, this is default Revit. Most everything is line weight 1, which I don't like because all fill patterns are line weight 1. By default, we can't change that. So if you want your whatever you're filling to stand out and the outline, if it's also line weight 1, then it just looks all the same. First thing I do is go to my line weights and see where I'm at and then the type of scales that I use. Once I know what these numbers are and how they're associated, I don't change them. I'll go back to my object styles, and then I'm gonna change what I need based on that other one. So this is default Revit, and this is my standard. I'm not changing the line weights themselves. If you're really gonna get into that, then you have to go back and forth with plotting, making sure it looks right. I'm just leaving what's, what's there with Revit and just changing mine to bump it up. Lastly, with view templates, by setting this, leaving your architectural plan, setting it how you need, your plot sheets are always going to look consistent. If you don't have them look consistent, then you always have issues where you send, you, you typically we plot to PDF, we post, people download them, and then they tell us, hey, what's up with this, or why is this, on, why am I seeing this stuff? Why am I seeing green lights? It's like, 
okay, you're just plotting the PDF and you don't realize that somebody went and changed the plot view instead of the working view and didn't change it back. So setting all of this, properties of your view, you go to your view template, you change that. Then in 2013, what I really like is when you go to your plot view and somebody doesn't open their working view, they can't change it because your view template is set. So that at least tells them a warning, I'm on the wrong sheet, let me go open my working view. Because there's always people that want to change it to fine, even though they're on eighth inch. You're not going to see it when it's plotted. It's like, why? I don't understand. So this at least tells them, oops, I'm on the wrong view. So that's one thing I like. And that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Um, how do you separate the working view from a sheet view? I mean, I know how you do it, but but for you personally, how do you? What's what's the benefit of separating the two? Um, and uh, yeah. for one, the project browser gets really long. So if I have you know 14 floors and I have three in the first floor alone, I'm going to have at least 10 views. So I separate it. I have a uh, now with 2013, there's view types, so I'll be using that. But um, I have a parameter where people physically have to set it to plot view, uh, working view. I also have interiors have their own plot sheets. It's basically just ease of looking through everything. And when you're in your, I have a working view set, so everybody knows to go through there. And that's usually a lot less because there aren't that many people. I may just be working on the first floor, so I don't have a working view for every floor. So. Okay. It seems like just in, in some of the, the, the products that we're working on, uh, it seems like it's more effective to be working in the sheet view because it has all the data that you would want to see if you print it. So, as like, far for as example, the all the, yeah, all the annotations. And so it feels like if we try to separate the working views and sheet views. We always end up wanting to work in the sheet, sheet view anyway, just because it has all the. Right, and you, we do that once you're in the CD phase, once you're in okay. towards, you know, we, yeah. You are talking earlier on. We're, yeah, more right. earlier on, it's more like, you really, I don't, personally, I don't work with any annotation on, because I'm basically modeling, changing things in the model. But when I am on a project where I am dealing with, I have to dimension this, I have to, then right. I am in the sheet view. But by that point, I really don't need to change the scale to help me work better, because it's already set up with what it needs to. So yeah, eventually we really have not that many working groups once we're on construction. Okay. One other connect question. Is there a way to have it automatically set up as each view is automatically a working group? Or do you have to go back and, and click on, okay, this is a working view? If you, if you create a new view, it's just an empty field, right? Yeah, it's empty. And typically I just make people just, rename it and then right. put it with the family view types. I don't know if you can force it to. Here, here's, here's something that with 13 you can do now is, uh, again, MEP had this for a while, um, you have sub-disciplines, and I believe with 13 now everybody has sub-disciplines. So you can use your sub-disciplines to filter out your views. So you could really create two disciplines, one for working and one for sheet if you wanted, and have that filter it for you. But you would have to still pick them after you create that view. I see. Yeah. And if and if you don't, you could always create your own parameter to the same way. Yeah, which is what we did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the one thing I really. I like believe Revit One Box has it, the the all in one, but I don't think Architecture and Structure 2013 have it. I think it's only in the one combined one. Yes. Didn't you show there was the uh, not on sheet with that automatically eliminate those on sheets? Yes. And. To add on to that, I don't know if you guys know, but there's a parameter for sheets, for a sheet list that you can say whether it's included in a sheet list or not, too. So that's a good parameter to tie to that. So if you have junk sheets or empty sheets, make sure those are unchecked so they don't show on your sheet list either. But yeah, that's yeah. true. Or presentation sheets. Or presentation sheets. Yeah, any sheet that you don't want is part of your official set. And by the way, that goes through links. So as an architect, if you're, um, if you're doing a sheet schedule and you choose to include links, which is a checkbox in the schedule, you can use that parameter. And if your consultants have their set up with that, then you automatically can get a good sheet list if they keep track of that. 
Um, something else that I do is at the kickoff meeting, we create a project parameter that we put in every model that has to do with the sheet discipline so that we can use that to sort the sheets. And if they do that in every model too, so for instance, uh, you know, we have one for site, two for structure, three for architecture, or whatever, to get the order we want. If everybody does that on all their sheets, that will come through the links also to the main architect file that's printing this, the master sheet list. So all of those project parameters that are in other projects can come through. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for Thank coming. Thank you, everyone. Just to, uh, so.